Love this podcast? Support it and sponsor today. Simply head to OzCastNetwork.com for details. It's The In Show, Australia's only show dedicated to innovation from Adelaide, Australia and across the globe. Hi, this is David Grice and Troy Sincock. This show is all about innovators and entrepreneurs, startups, people with great ideas who are really making them a reality and the challenges they've faced along the way. They don't always see what's before them, David, when they come up with the idea and then all of a sudden they're like, this is a goer. Oh my goodness, we've got to get this done. We need another 30 people. <laughs> yeah, yeah, it's really amazing to hear how that, that all comes and, you know, the fact that, you know, you, you talk to some of these people and they, they've got their great idea but they're kind of making it up as they go along mm. and then get to a point where they think, oh my gosh, you know, like how the heck are we going to move forward from here and, and what do I need and how do I resource myself and all those sorts of things come into play and I think those stories to me are some of the most inspirational ones when you find out that actually, these are just ordinary people doing something extremely incredible things. Yeah, we'll catch up with a few more a little bit later on. And don't forget to subscribe to our new feed in Apple Podcasts to keep listening to the In Show podcast. Just resubscribe to the In Show with the coloured logo. David, on the show today, we'll head into the world of education. Yeah, looking forward to this. I mean, you can remember around about nine months ago, I think around episode five, we had Ashley Manuel from Growing With Gratitude. And he talks a lot about these concepts of mindfulness and gratitude and, and, you know, small things that you can do to bring into your life to actually help you live in a state of, uh, of gratitude. Well, it's been nearly a year since we first came across him. And the work he's doing with teachers and students and families to actually develop these habits is really incredible. And um, we're going to find out more about his journey because it would be really interesting to see how far he's come Mm -hmm. in in this period of time. And we're also going to reveal a new podcast which aims to inspire kids to embrace reading as part of their creative expression. And it creates an invaluable resource on how to get that book into a child's hands. And this is about removing that feeling of reading being a chore and making it an exciting adventure. I went to a literacy conference and I was fortunate enough to hear American author Stephen Lane talk about the power of reading aloud and he read aloud part of a novel and he read it in such a compelling way that he had 800 people on the edge of their seat and he stopped at the cliffhanger, the bit that everybody wanted to hear in you know, the next part of the story. And, of course, everybody's reaction was they turned to each other and said, I want to get that book, I want to find out what happens next. And that's what got me thinking about this idea for the podcast. We'll hear more from Writers Read later. But now here's Claire with more in news, including a story about how smart cities are about to harness the power of AI technology to improve security. What have you got for us, Claire? Guys, this week I'll be talking about why our knuckles crack. But first, a project called Rainforest Connection has teamed with schools and Google to save the world's jungles. Rainforest Connection is using machine learning technology to detect loggers and poachers in Sumatra, Cameroon and the Amazon. But of course, these areas are huge and they're extremely hard to monitor. So Rainforest Connection has enlisted the help of students. Through the project's partnership with Google, they've run workshops in American schools that teach students how to make a guardian, a small piece of technology that monitors and records sound. It's basically a solar-powered phone that's connected to a network. It can alert the authorities when it senses sounds of illegal activity, detecting sounds like gunshots, chainsaws, voices and sound waves generated by certain animal species. Plus, they can be stationed about 25 kilometres from a cell tower. It uses Google's TensorFlow platform to store and integrate data into the cloud. On Earth Day, April 22, the students will be able to download an app and listen to a live stream of the sounds being recorded. Have you ever wondered why or how our knuckles crack or whether it actually causes us harm? Scientists from French engineering school Ecole Polytechnique created a new mathematical model to study the cracking sounds. According to their research, fluid in between the knuckle joints reduces friction between them. But when they're stretched quickly, the pressure drop creates gas bubbles. They found that when the bubbles expand to a certain point, they either collapse completely or slightly, which generates that delightful sound. All the scientists have to do now is prove their findings in an experiment. Plus, it's good news for those who do enjoy a bit of knuckle cracking from time to time. 
smart cities are about to harness the power of AI technology to improve security. A smart city is a town that invests time, effort and money into using technology to create an efficient, high quality, sustainable and low cost living environment. However, they have the potential to become even greater and safer with the help of AI. You can compare the way a city works to the way our bodies function. There are so many factors that play out to ensure everything runs smoothly. Our brains constantly receive feedback from the nervous system and our bodies ward off potential threats by using its immune system. Smart cities have digital sensors placed in bins, street lamps and other physical objects that are connected to the internet and shared data. But they're not being used as a source of feedback that can help protect our smart cities. If they were, every smart city would have somewhat of an immune system and would be able to detect signs of impending disaster, like a collapsing road or an overheating power plant. This means authorities could deal with problems sooner and prevent future disasters. Imagine that. And that's what's in news this week. Thanks very much, Claire. Well, isn't that interesting, David? I mean, the world of AI is just so expansive. The impact it's having is incredible globally. And think of how machine learning plays into this as well. You know, like as the machine understands what information it's it's been given, what then can happen as a result? I I think what we can find is that we're going to get information that we don't even know we're looking for yet. Mm, mm. And I think then that opens up a whole myriad of different possibilities that don't yet exist as well. And and think about also the business opportunities that come with that and, mm. and that sort of thing. So, you know, protection of our people, it could be around, you know, habits of, of waste and, and litter and, you know, will certain bins be collecting certain rubbish that we didn't know that, you know, and that was based on the fact that there's a particular shop just nearby or something like that mm. and how can we improve the quality of our life for our citizens? It's so powerful. Mm. Yeah, well, you know, Adelaide where we do this show is a uh, smart city and, you know, I, you know, it makes you think that we're really, or we've, you know, we've taken on that title it's really just the tip of the iceberg, isn't it? Uh, completely. And it's not just about parking and, and things like that. I mean, you know, some of these new street light poles that are coming out that uh, that are called smart poles, I mean, understanding that each one of those are connected to the internet and that, you know, it, it senses when somebody's walking towards the light, you know, at night and therefore the light shines brighter so that there's a, a you know, an easier way for people to walk through the, the city. I mean, in, in America, in Columbus, Ohio, they're putting in these smart poles that have actually got PowerPoints and speakers in them so that buskers can just go plug in. And, wow. uh, and, you know, they just stand at the street light pole. They don't have to take an amp anymore. So this is all about things that, that can also impact just the culture of a city and the way a city feels. Absolutely fantastic. Really exciting stuff. It's David Grice and Troy Simcock. We're talking innovation on The In Show. You can check us out at theinshow.online, Facebook, and follow The In Show on Twitter. And coming up, we catch up with Ashley Manuel from Growing With Gratitude, a year on from our first chat to hear about how he's helping to create a better planet one kid at a time. It's all about innovation. The In Show. Hi, I'm Matt. And I'm Luke. We're from Nervous Res. And you're listening to The In Show. It's David Grice and Troy Sincock. Soon we'll reveal a new podcast which aims to get that book in children's hands and has them really embracing reading. If you've missed an episode, make sure you subscribe to The In Show podcast on iTunes and be sure to resubscribe to our new feed. That's The In Show with the coloured logo. The In Show. We met Ashley Manuel from Growing With Gratitude soon after we began The In Show. In fact, he was featured on one of our first episodes, episode five. He's doing great work in the classroom, helping teachers, students and families develop the habits of gratitude, kindness and mindfulness, work that has impact well beyond the classroom. So, Ashley, just set the scene again. What is Growing With Gratitude? So, Troy, Growing With Gratitude is a or started out as a primary school program. So what it is, it's about teaching uh, students, uh, primary school age students what I call habits of gratitude and kindness and empathy, mindfulness and serving others, particularly focusing on those areas. And what we actually do, we provide a fully resourced program for teachers to teach in the classroom, as well as some in-class practice as well and also some teacher education around it at the same time. Mm -hmm. Well, how did you create this idea in the first place? Why is this work so important to you? It stems back to about 10 years ago. I actually came across positive psychology for my own benefit and had a massive impact on my life. And in, in short, I, I just wish I learned it as a kid. And using my skills as a primary school teacher and what I learned, I thought, well, if I could put something together, a program based on knowing how a school works, but using those principles that I learned for myself, 
Uh, that, that's how it originally originally started, uh, and it's just developed from there. And, and I think having that background of knowing that teachers are time poor, they always get stuff added to their daily schedules and not much taken away. So that's the idea I've got. Okay, well, it's got to be really fully resourced, otherwise teachers won't do it and schools won't take it on, so they don't have to actually create anything themselves. It's just having that those little insights to how it works. Mm. It's one thing having the idea, but you were a teacher yourself in the first instance. How did you enrol everyone else in the idea that the Growing With Gratitude program was something worthwhile doing? Yeah, it's, it's a good question because it was actually one of the, or another reason why I started is there was a big push for positive education in primary schools. But what was, what was happening, nobody really knew what to do. Like the school that I was at, uh, and she would admit it herself because I know she did, but she didn't really have any idea what she was doing. And her role was the wellbeing coordinator. And it was a new role at the school at the time. Mm. Uh, and would, as staff, would receive the odd email with a link to an article, a few posters around the school, but we didn't really know how to implement it in the classroom. Um, so there was, there was the, the need for it and the want for it from schools. So I, I guess I saw that there as well and thought, well, if I can execute a really good uh, program based on, as I said, what I learned, um, there was there was room for it. So I, I didn't really have to enrol as such. It was just filling a, a gap, I think, that was in the yeah, in schools. Obviously, well-being is something that we're talking about in all walks of life at the moment, not just with children but with adults and, and all that sort of thing. You must have seen in the last, well, since we last spoke to you, some pretty incredible stuff happening. Can you share anything that you, you've seen among some of the kids you've been working with? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, there's, there's always... The, a couple of good stories that, that come out from, from school visits and talking to schools who take on the program. And a, a couple that come to mind is particularly the ones, I think the, the most rewarding ones that you hear about are the ones that come from parents at home. So what they're learning in the classroom is translating into the home as well. There was a time when a dad, it was, went to the classroom, it was a year three teacher, and said to the, said to the teacher, what have you done to my son? And she looked looked at him, <laughs> and she said, oh no, what have I done? And he said, well, he's, he's starting to do things around the house because that's part of the program about serving others, doing things around the house without being asked. He's saying he's grateful for things. He's saying his thank yous, and just stories like that are really good, a positive thing. And you think, well, hang on, well, it is having making a difference, and then they're taking it back home as well. And it's also good for parents as well because if you like, for me, I stumbled across positive psychology and realise you can actually practice habits of gratitude and kindness, uh, empathy and, and things such as that, those, or things such as those things, and they actually help you with your, your happiness and, and your resilience, but it takes practice. And if pa- parents who are in their 30s or 40s, they might not have heard of this before and they might not be aware of it. So if their children are bringing it home, what they've learned in school, though it might be beneficial for them as parents. How are the teachers finding the students' behaviour as a result of going through the program? Have you had any feedback around a child that was traditionally really bad at, at, at being engaged with school and their, and their classmates and they're turning their lives around in that respect? Yeah, there's, there's probably a, a couple. It's more of a – not so much individual but more as a like a class in general like because the atmosphere is a bit kinder or – Karma. I think there was, a, there was a story from a year five class where the students were quite mean to each other, basically, like a lot of bullying within the class. But I think once they actually started practicing about being grateful and, and about being kind, it was it was a bit of a difference in the the attitude of the kids. Probably more understanding the empathy side of things, thinking about well, if I'm going to say something mean to that person, well, would I want something mean said to me? So it's just having that awareness actually to practice about it because I think. Sometimes kids, maybe it, it, they just don't think and something will just come out of their mouth and it'll be a, a put down and they don't realise it. But if you actually, it's an awareness thing, it starts with an awareness of thinking, well, hang on, if, if that happened to me, I wouldn't like it. So it's actually practising that about thinking about it. Mm. It sounds like, um, you know, what the kids develop is a real discipline. Can you tell me around, you know, so in learning some of these skills, you're thinking about things differently. But, you know, when you're taught to be polite, often, you know, that can be just about the the front that you put on. So, you know, you're seen to be an upstanding citizen where, you know, meanwhile in the background all sorts of stuff could could be going on. Is part of this program people not stepping over things that need to be said and, you know, the ways that they can communicate when things aren't right for them? I think it's um, 
certainly an awareness to if things aren't going well for for someone um, within themselves, I think it's an awareness to give them strategies of how to deal with those situations. Mm. It might not work for everyone, but at least we provide opportunities to, okay, well, have you tried this or have you practiced this and give them actual suggestions of ways to do it. I just actually, before I came to meet you guys, it was uh, I just was at a school and we're at the front giving them some ideas about if they are feeling a bit sad or a bit mad or a bit angry, what can you actually do to make yourself feel just a little bit better? And it's not about going from being angry or mad to being happy as Larry doing cartwheels around the room in excitement. It's very hard to go from that negative to that over-the-top positive state of mind straight away. But you can do these little things again that can help you make help make yourself feel just a little bit better Mm -hmm. and then we can demonstrate ways to actually do that through activities ways of thinking and it just provides the opportunities for children to try things Mm. and one thing might work for one kid but might not work for the other but it's just a few different varieties Mm. you know when you created the idea for growing with gratitude so you had a you probably developed a starting point and kind of you know the the type of vision i wouldn't it be great to get to that point from that initial stage and then now that it's in you know, in motion and you're actually you know, doing it day to day, has your vision or how to get there changed? Yeah, absolutely. I, when I was first started, I had no idea what I was doing. The only thing that I had, because <laughs> I, I was, I, I never had any uh, inkling to be a run a business or anything like that. I was just always brought up just thinking you go to work and then you retire when you're 65 or whatever it is. And then mm-hmm. but I just came across this way of thinking about. Well, um, I think I mentioned it last time in an interview about living on your terms doing what you want but also adding enough value where people are willing to pay for what you do. And I sort of came across that philosophy by listening to a lot of podcasts and reading a lot of material and it kept on coming back to just start, just start it and work it as you go. And a really good book that helped me on my way was The Slight Edge by Jeff Olson, which talks about doing little things each day to get you where you want to go. So it might not be jamming 12 hours a day in to work on all this stuff, but it's just making these little little goal meeting these little goals each day over time will get to where you want to go and that really resonated with me because I just I just understood what he was really talking about Mm. and so I started to apply a lot of those principles of just doing something every day whether it was making a phone call to somebody I thought would be a good connection and what's the worst that could happen they don't answer they don't get back to you Mm -hmm. and it's just basically going in doing something every day and just working as you go and I guess changing direction and in a way, I still do that. But I think um, as time goes by, you, you work out uh, what practices work best because uh, before we started recording, we were talking about sometimes you just work on something just for the sake of it, but it's not actually getting to where you're going, mm. uh, where, well, sorry, where you want to go. So now I'm a lot better at stopping and thinking and say, well, okay, I've got to execute on this. What are the tasks that I need to do for that this week? And then break it down. What are the tasks, I'm going to, the three tasks I'm going to do today to get me to that goal and it's a it's a it's a good process to do but uh it, it's taken a while to do that but the actual where we want to go I, I still don't know in the next five years where we'll go but um yeah a lot, lot clearer than when i first started <laughs> <laughs> that's great and and have you picked up a mentor or somebody that's helping you along the way over since we last spoke to you yeah i guess mentors are um can come in different ways it could be a mentor that you read a book it could be a, a podcast guru or someone that you listen to who's got some really good ideas. That could be a mentor. Uh, and for me, I've actually recently been to some Kerwin Ray events um, in Sydney. He had a, went to his three-day event and he's really good at the marketing side of things and the execution and coming up with some really good ideas. So at the moment, I'm right into his uh, content and um, using his philosophy, I guess, which is a lot about video uh, marketing yeah, video content and uh, and when the, we talk about the marketers like Gary V and those people, and they're always about the video. And it's just about putting as much quality content where it's going to be about serving others. So it's not about so much these days about um, posting a, a, a Facebook post and then putting a, a link to download something all the time. It's about giving value to people just through a video, giving me a tip and not asking for anything in exchange. And once you get those, I guess, build the trust of people. It might be four or five videos down the track, then you might offer something. So it's just just learning those things as you go off those, I guess, off those mentors. And he's the person I'm into at the moment. Yeah, and that kind of takes away that real hard sell yeah, you know, when it comes to it as well. So it becomes something about, would you say it's like building community? 
as opposed to trying to get the community to give you back something. Mm. Oh, absolutely. Uh, I think exactly it's exactly right. And actually, according to Kerwin, Kerwin Ray's stats, is that it's I think it's twenty uh, mere exposures he calls it. So when when you so, somebody on Facebook, for example, might see your post, but they won't take any notice of you until they've seen you twenty times. So that's some stats out there at the moment. So it's about yeah, giving in a lot of value, building that community, so people want to come to you and hear what you got to say. And you know, do you feel a real need in this area as you know people's lives you know become busy as they start disconnecting and you know using social media more? Do you feel like there's a pull for you know humans to look at the type of area that you're working on? Yeah, abs- oh, absolutely. I think um, it's it's just something to be. It's an awareness thing. I think it's um, we we all know like about what gratitude is and what kindness is, but sometimes we we so. We live in a world with technology and whatever it is that's just so fast that we sometimes forget and forget to stop and just reflect on actually how lucky we are to have what we have. And so I think that is a very important part of people still. And I think it's and kids and there's a stat out at the moment by twenty thirty, depression will be the leading disease in the developed world. Mm. And that's the kids of today, really. Mm-hmm. And they're only going to get swamped by more and more technology coming through and more and more advances. In, in the world, so and a lot of a lot more stress is going to come on them. So if we can give them these skills from a young age to deal with certain situations and be aware of it, um, make, when I say be aware, I like give them the strategies um, around um, having the awareness to to stop and reflect and skills such as those. I think we're going to at least make a little, might be a new difference, but mm. then yeah, some hey. difference. How do you uh, you see technology playing a part in in this stress and this pressure? Because, I mean, I know for me as a uh, as somebody who you know loves to be involved and busy in all that sort of thing, that the more technology I have at my disposal, the more is expected of me. So as a result of that, you know, if I don't get back to an email within a half an hour of somebody sending me something, everyone gets really annoyed. How how do you think this is affecting children and and the way they are? Yeah, it's it's a really good question, Dave. Well, it, it's it's hard to answer because they might not be the stage where they, they're at that type of stage, but they've been exposed to it. Like we all, most students will have access to a laptop at least, and a lot of schools work off iPads and their yeah, laptops now to actually do their schoolwork. So they get exposed to technology, and they're going basically it's the way of the world, and they're going to have to. If we can, edu- I think the way to do it is education about how to handle the situation. And I know exactly what you're saying. I'm the same, like, and I feel that I have to respond straight away if it's text or email or make a phone call back. Mm. Um, otherwise, you think, oh, I might miss an opportunity or uh, you sort of think you've got to act a lot quicker and it's easy to use as well. So because it's easy, you think, well, okay, I'll just do it now. But if you've got 20 situations like that, they all build up and it can cause a lot of stress. So I think it's just about that education really and I'm not sure the answer to be honest. <laughs> mm-hmm. And so is uh, the focus of your work about, you know, just having kids really present to what's going on? There must be so many distractions yeah. uh, around them, you know, they're getting pulled in all sorts of different areas. Yeah, it's certainly a part of it. I think that's the mindfulness type mm. part of it. And uh, I mean, we touch on in the Growing With Gratitude program, we do touch on it. It's not mm. the entire focus, but there are a lot of brilliant programs and apps out there that um, like Headspace and that comes to mind in particular, which is a really good mindfulness um, practice and a lot of schools do do that uh, but um, yeah it's definitely an awareness of practice as well and it, it is practice that's what we it's like learning how to kick a football or serve in tennis like it's, it's actually a, pr- a skill that we need to teach or not, not only just children but for ourselves as adults we need to actually practice it mm. so we actually do it and it becomes a habit so tell us how the the program's been growing since we we last saw you. I mean, growing with gratitude is growing, <laughs> and we can see it happening all around us. And I'd just love to hear yeah. what's happened since we last spoke. Yeah, I think um, we were just talking before. It was about eight nine months ago when we last spoke, and um, since then uh, the school program is still moving. Or it's, it's growing each year, or sorry, growing since last time we spoke. And so we've still got we're reaching. I think it might be even two thirds of the schools in South Australia that we've reached over the last three years uh, and obviously building on from last time we spoke, we've reached a, a number of more of those schools and now it's certainly um, in different states in Australia and overseas as well. 
and we've got schools in uh, different states, but um, <laughs> overseas as well. But also, what's actually just happened um, in the last month? We've taken Growing with Gratitude and created Growing with Gratitude Sports. So what it is is obviously most children go to school, but a lot of children also play sport. And the idea of behind Growing with Gratitude is impact as many students as or children as we can. And what we're doing now is Growing with Gratitude Sports about teaching coaches of how they can incorporate habits around gratitude and kindness and empathy into their training sessions and matches. That's something that's happened in the last, well, probably six weeks, I reckon now. And yeah, it's sort of um, the next stage and I guess the next arm to growing with gratitude. And it's certainly that's happened since last time we spoke. Mm-hmm. Are you focusing that on particular sports? No, nah, it's all sports. Um, I, I mean, personally, I had a football and cricket background, but uh, it's it's certainly available for all sports. Uh, we we're um, running two pilots. We're actually, funny enough, at football clubs, but it's not um, it's not just for football. It's for all sports, and we've had a lot of interest. And I think it's going to take off quite quickly. It's really interesting you raise cricket, given what the Australian cricket team is going through at the moment. And you know, particularly, I, I think you know when you think of you know kindness and, and empathy. You know, what you see these adults and what they're having to deal with, you know, that they've created these lives for themselves where they thought it was going to go a certain way and then there have been some decisions made that are just completely changing the course of their lives. It's really clear that people are pretty quick to criticise before actually considering, you know, what the person themselves is going through. So I would imagine, you know, if, in, a, in a sporting scenario, you know, you know you go to like a footy game or something, there's all sorts of abuse being hurled from the sidelines and that kind of thing. How do kids deal with that? Because, you know, there are parents on sidelines of, you know, sporting teams who get a bit carried away from time to time. Yeah, I mean, it's it's something that um, it's a bit of a, a, play, a wait and see in terms of how it's going to work. Yeah. But we've got the philosophy, we've got the ideas mm. and we'll just start. And then, as I said, we just work it as we go. That's how I've done, always done it. But yeah. the way that I see it really being effective is just really lowering the bar and getting the children for a start at such a young age to understand how lucky they are. They get a chance to play sport as a start. Yeah. And then also be uh, grateful for uh, just having the, the equipment that they do, their teammates and the umpires because if we don't have umpires, we don't play. Mm. And And just having those little activities – based a lot around questions. So we teach the, the coaches how to ask the questions to get them to reflect on those sort of things. But again, it's like instead of it's not just about the skills of the sport that they're learning, it's about these other skills as well. And it takes practice. So there's no better way to actually practice these skills than in sports because, I mean, you can learn so much about life through sports anyway as it is, but we can just add this little bit to a sporting club and help the help the coaches do it. Well, it's not only going to help the, the students, but it's going to build a community as well around the club. There's a stat that 250,000 kids withdraw from competitive sport a year in Australia, which is huge. Mm. And I mean, that could be a number of reasons. It could be financial reasons because fees are quite high, maybe to play at a club, but it could be from bad experiences through kids being bullied in teams. But if we can create that community that parents know that they're going to send their children out to a practice, that they're going to get taught these skills, well, hopefully that retention and clubs will help help the club community as well. Mm. We spoke last time about your partnership with the Adelaide Football Club. Um, how has that grown in the last little while? What actually happened um, not long after the first interview was the government, the state government uh, under Suzanne Close, who's uh, the state education minister in South Australia, they uh, committed to putting in 450000 over three years to keep the partnership going. That started about six months ago, so that'll extend the Crows and Growing Gratitude Partnership for another well, two and a half years at least, and hopefully um, we'll continue it on. But we've created more content, so the schools who had the original Growing with Gratitude Crows visit, we've actually got new content for those schools. So we're keeping it fresh, keeping the the messages new, and again, yeah, again, we'll we'll reach another hundred and fifty or one hundred twenty to one hundred fifty schools again in South Australia this year through that. And that's probably twenty five to thirty thousand students. So wow, that's unbelievable. It's, um, yeah, it's a really good partnership to have, and and they're an amazing club, not just uh, in their schools program, but the difference they make out in the community, not just as a on field football team, but as a big organisation, is pretty incredible, actually. Mm. And tell us about your international work that you're doing. Yeah, so we, we uh, we've got a little team over in India, 
and we're aiming to get Growing With Gratitude into schools over there. And it'll be slightly different because the, the schools work differently over there in that probably 90% of the schools are owned by private companies or owned by royal families and, and they'll own a number of schools which they call institutions. And what will actually happen, we'll have over there, we'll have actually a little team that will go in and facilitate it. We're over in Australia, the teachers actually facilitate it themselves. So it's a slightly different model. Uh, and over there, it's, 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 um, it can be a slow process, but we're, we're uh, making good, <laughs> good inroads over there and we've got our team on the ground and it's, uh, yeah, it's, just, it's just a matter of um, growing it now and hopefully go over there in the next month or two to really start it up. But mm-hmm. yeah, over in India and also same in the UK, we've got a couple of people over there who are keen to take the Growing With Gratitude program on. So it's like a, a partnership in a way. They've, they've come and seen what, what it's about and instead of like reinventing something um, themselves, well, we've come to agreement, well, why don't we partner up and you can take it over there in terms of commercial sense to share mm-hmm. revenue share type model as well. So that's been really effective in a few mm. countries. Why did you identify India as you know your first international market to step into, and how did you find the people to start doing the work? Now, the way it came about originally to go over there was in May last year. I uh, got connected with the Darren Lehman Cricket Academy uh, in, which is run out of South Australia, and they had an arm called Sport and Ed, Sport and Education, and that was run by uh, a teacher in from Adelaide and also a guy. Um, who used to play first-class cricket. And they were going over to India, and I knew uh, Sean Watt, his name is. He was a um, head of a PAC. So they invited me to go along and do some, te- I guess, teacher teacher training over there with them in India, in uh, Delhi. And we went over there in May, and we presented some workshops to an institution called Appy J. And they flew in from, they've got institutions across India, and they flew in about 40 or 50 staff. And we did some leadership, we did some well-being um, activities and training with them. So that's how it first came about. And the f- pure fact there is some ridiculous number of like 250 million students um, in India is attractive. Now, it's not easy to do in terms of commercial business sense. It's not easy to do business over there. So what happened when I came back to Adelaide, got introduced to a guy called Vin, who's an, an Indian but lives in Adelaide, and he... His family is a very successful uh, business through textiles and construction in, in India, and he, he's come out here with his family, but he still runs a part of the, the textiles from Adelaide. So I got introduced to him, and he's helped me put the team on the ground over there and get started. So it's come uh, along, as I said before, slowly, but it, it's just the way it is over there. It takes time, but if we can really pick it up and get some momentum, the potential over there is ridiculous. Mm. How difficult then is it for you, like you talked about the fact that you needed somebody with local knowledge to help you with that. What else do you need when you're, you're getting into a foreign market like India? Yeah, oh, that's, a, that's a good question. I think it's the, the little, it's just not the knowledge of how things work. I mean, it doesn't matter where it is. And it's just obviously, it's just totally different culture. I'm not sure if many listeners have been there, but it's it's an interesting place. And it's a lot, I love, I've been there a couple of times now. It's just a great place to, to go and visit. It's just nothing like we are used to in Australia and things are just done totally differently and it's just those little things that you don't even think of which can be a huge help with having those people on the ground in the local country and oh, I can't remember, there's, there's some big companies that that don't go into India because it's just too hard um, from an outside like European companies or anything like that but if you've got people who are willing to help over there, it's yeah, it's, it's the way to go. Now, as you're growing, what are the challenges that you face that you you know didn't foresee at the beginning? That's a, that's a that's a really good question. Just uh, taking probably taking on too much. Like when you start out, it's what do I do? Like you're sort of looking around things. What can I do and try to create stuff for yourself? But now, the more you go on, more opportunities come up with collaborations, with partnerships. So it's just working out those ones that you really want to take on. And there's there's times when you you find it very hard to say no, mm-hmm. but it's just um, working out what what's uh, what's the best thing to work on work on next. So that would be a real tricky thing because you're kind of balancing two things. I'm really interested to see how this works for you. You're running a business on one side, and you know you it should generate income to make a living, but on the other side you've got this real humanity. 
And it seems to me that, you know, you wouldn't start a business in this area unless you were really passionate about making a difference with people. Mm. How does one play against the other? And do you find yourself sometimes going, you know, your eyes light up, I could make millions of dollars here. Mm. And and how do you keep the people, you know, the focus on people first and foremost? Yeah, that's a good question. I think... um I think we're living, particularly schools, they expect a lot for free. And I think it's it's fair enough. And it's so I do give a lot away for free. I'd give probably 80% of what I do away for free going in in class visits. A lot of it's for free. Uh, materials we've got on the Growing Gratitude website, there's a library that's a free resource library. And there is a paid, obviously, element to it as the whole school approach. But it's just giving as much value as you can for people and you hope they see enough value in it thinking, well, if I, if he's providing this as free content, well, the paid stuff must be really good as well. Um, so you, I think it's the, I think it's just the way of the world as well. I think it's the way it's going. You just got to give as much as way you can free for people to consume. And then if, if they think it's good enough, the quality's great. Well, that's when you can make um, that money off it as well. But uh, it's, and just on that, we um, I've actually, joined up with a not-for-profit called GIFT. And one element of GIFT is a schools program, which is called the Universal Classroom Project, where we bring in a lot of people in this space of positive education, well-being in schools to donate content and bring it in and make creating a platform which will be free for schools. So when it will get funding, or the aim is to get funding to fund the website and the running of it and provide that, that resource as well. So that's another way that we're trying to yeah, help as many people as we can without, I guess, costing because that's, yeah, I know that's a, it's a really good question and it's a bit of a balance because you obviously, I mean, you've got to look after yourself in that you've got bills to pay and things like that. It's just finding that balance about, well, how much do you you serve others for free and ask for that paid content. But if you're giving enough value and providing enough people willing to pay you anyway. Mm. I think there's a lot of power in what you're talking about because it, it seems to me like, Everything you do is about somebody else and it's it's very rarely about yourself and that's pretty rare to find in, in many, many people, especially around the entrepreneurs and, and those sorts of things. How has that been in terms of just ensuring that uh, – I think it's a similar question to what you just asked. You know, it's got to be front and centre. How's the response been for, for you? Like are, are people recognising that or is that something that you're struggling to – to sort of get people to understand that that's that's really what's making it tick. Yeah, well, just going back a step, well, it certainly wasn't always like that, mm, mm, mm. <laughs> and it took practice. It was like that's what I'm saying. I came across this way of positive psychology, and it's about it's not about me; it's about other people. And I think reading a book about well, probably three years ago now, the Book of Joy by the Dalai Lama and um, Desmond Tutu, who talk about like it's we're, we're all people. It's about serving others and doing things for other people, and part of that journey that I went through about 10 years ago is about what can what can I do today to help someone else? And that's just without expecting anything in return. And it becomes a habit. So a lot of the mm. things that you do, like you just ask yourself, okay, what can I do today to take do something for somebody else? And even if it's just picking up a, a coffee mug at the cafe and just taking it back to the, the counter and just getting the habit of doing that because if you're doing those little things, then those more, I guess, important, meaningful things just come more habitually and uh, the second part of the question I don't look for it like it doesn't bother me if people don't recognize me for it some people want that recognition and it's a lot of it's a recognition's a massive issue in a lot of workplaces because people don't get recognized enough uh, and it bothers them Um, but for me it's never bothered me recognition I just do it because I know that within myself I'm actually trying to make a difference to people and sometimes you don't even know if you're making a difference because some people don't know how to say thanks they just feel embarrassed if you're giving them something or trying to do something for them, they feel embarrassed at receiving it and they just don't know how to say thank you and it doesn't bother me. Like it's it's yeah, it's it's one of those things you just do it because you think it's gonna help someone and if it does, it's great. If not, well you've had a go. <laughs> well, actually we're a big fan of your work. It seems that a whole lot of little things are making something really big happen. Congratulations on your know, things expanding into other territories and it's great to catch up with your journey with growing with gratitude. Excellent. Thanks, Dave. Thanks, Troy. Thanks for your time. Find out more at growingwithgratitude.com.au. It's David Grice and Troy Sincock on The In Show. Next, we're learning more about a new innovation to get kids reading and loving it. Download the Phona app before you head to your next event. Find people easier, market yourself better, and get connected using Phona. That's spelled P-F-O-N-R. Phona, available in the App Store now. 
Hi, I'm Nick McArdle from the Adelaide Crows, and you're with Troy and David on The In Show. The In Show. Now, David, some kids love reading. Some do it because it's part of the school curriculum, and others just can't stand it. But there is a way to inspire kids to embrace reading and let their imaginations run wild. Oh, yeah. Look, I think one of the things that uh, that the research is really showing is that if you can have somebody to mentor the kids and get them to develop a love of reading through recommendations, um, that's something that that is starting to build, you know, people's reading journey or reading life or, or whatever. But we've developed this new podcast that really focuses on helping the teachers to make reading really enjoyable and, you know, make it a fun experience for all the children that are in the class. And the podcast's called Writers Read by Lee Tracy. Now, Tracy, you're a school teacher that's really passionate about getting people to read. What's actually inspired you to, to go along that path and teach these kids how important reading is? Well, I've always been passionate about getting books in children's hands and seeing them happy and engaged with great literature. But it was probably last year I went to a literacy conference. I was fortunate enough to hear American author Stephen Lane talk about the power of reading aloud. And this is something that's well documented. It's not new information and and teachers everywhere know how important reading aloud is. But he really demonstrated it for the audience in a very captivating way. So he had a lecture theatre of about 800 people and he read aloud part of a novel and he read it in such a compelling way that he had 800 people on the edge of their seat wanting to hear what was going to happen next and he stopped at the cliffhanger, the bit that everybody wanted to hear in the next part of the story and, of course, everybody's reaction was they turned to each other and said, I want to get that book, I want to find out what happens next. And it was probably at that moment when I realised how powerful the read aloud can be and how, when it's read in a really engaging way, the impact that it can have on the listeners. And that's what got me thinking about this idea for the podcast. And really, even before the podcast, I was thinking about how amazing would it be to have an author in my classroom every week who could do that, who could speak to my students and get them so enthusiastic about that book or an author or a series but it's really cost prohibitive. It's very expensive to have an author come to your school, a very worthwhile thing to do, but is perhaps something that happens annually, once a year. The idea for the podcast really came out of that thinking about, well, if I can't bring an author to my classroom physically, often perhaps I can go to the authors and um, have them read part of their book so that I could play it for my students. All right, thanks, Tracy. Well, here's a taste of Writer's Read by Lit Tracy. Writers Read by Lit Tracy, getting that book in children's hands. Hi, I'm Tracy Grice and welcome to the Writers Read podcast. One of the quotes that inspires me in my practice as a teacher, in fact it's the one that sits front and centre of my desk at school, is written by Nancy Atwell, an internationally acclaimed author, and she says that for students of every ability and background, it's a simple, miraculous act of reading a good book that turns them into readers. Because even for the least experienced, most reluctant reader, it's the one good book that changes everything. The job of adults who care about reading is to move heaven and earth to put that book into a child's hands. And that's why this podcast exists. Each podcast will feature a published author who is going to talk about their reading life and they'll talk about their own reading strengths and struggles and really who they are as a reader so that children can get an insight into the life of a proficient reader or an adult reader. And then what we're going to ask them to do is to read a portion of one of their books and then stop at the cliffhanger in the story in the hope that this may be the book that turns a child into a reader. Adelaide's known as the Festival State and one of the festivals Adelaide hosts each year is Writers' Week. So Writers' Week is a really vibrant festival held in a park and there's, you know, both adults and children alike and um, it's got a great vibe to it. And I got to sit down with award-winning author Sophie Laguna and it was um, a great experience to sit in the park with Sophie and hear her read her book Bird and Sugar Boy. I found Birds, a field guide by A.P. Davies when I was eight. I was in the op shop with Dad because we needed something to make me look like a pineapple for the school concert, which was about the five food groups. Dad was looking for green clothes that could be the top of the pineapple. The other kids were getting their costumes sewn by their mothers, but Dad said if he couldn't find it at the op shop, it couldn't be found anywhere, and he'd fix the fuel lead, but he wasn't going to start bloody sewing. During the Adelaide Writers' Week Festival, I was so fortunate to meet with beloved children's author Jackie French. 
and she told me about her reading life, some of her strengths and struggles, some of the books that she loves, and she shared a couple of her books with me. And now here's a sneak peek of what's to come on the next Writer's Read podcast. There's one that turned me into a reader and I loved it. Grandma read it to me and I still remember the beginning. It was about the battle between a cat and a mouse and I just loved it. But because I'm dyslexic, I learned to read in a very different way from the way most people read. But I always had books and so many books changed my life. When I met Jackie French, I was a little bit like a deer in the headlights. It it was kind of like meeting your favourite rock star. Um, But what I found was she was so generous and giving with her time and she had so much that she wanted to share, not just with me, but the, the listeners and students that she knew that this podcast would reach. I don't know how Rebecca's going to do it because Jackie French has written over 140 books. It will be really interesting to see what Rebecca comes up with in her Rebecca Recommends segment. All this on the next Writer's Read podcast. And you can check out Writer's Read by Lit Tracy on Facebook, Twitter and Instagram. Next week on The In Show. We're going to hear more from the world of innovation and Claire will have incredible ideas being developed from all corners of the globe. Don't forget to resubscribe to The In Show on iTunes, the new feed with the coloured logo. Listen to the podcast. You can listen to all the podcasts we've done over the almost last year and rate us five stars if you're enjoying it. And we're online at theinshow.online. Now, before we go, here's Dan Thorsland, General Manager of Adelaide gaming company Mighty Kingdom, talking about the value of the gaming industry in creating art, content and a memorable user experience. The game industry, like, it really is the focal point for all of the technology skills that we have and all of the content creation skills that we have. If you can create an emotionally engaging moment that's hidden in the surprise of playing something that's really fun for somebody who's stuck on a city bus somewhere. I think that's that's the pinnacle mm. of entertaining somebody. And I'm an entertainer. I love to tell stories, obviously. Um, uh, everyone, I think, at Mighty Kingdom really sees themselves as artists and entertainers. They want people to have a lot of fun playing a Mighty Kingdom game. We don't want to just take their money and walk away. We never talk about it as monetization. We always talk about it as funetization. Yeah. You know, give them something that they really want to do, and they'll keep doing it. Yeah. And um, yeah. So to me, that's my advice to anyone wanting to get into the industry: is that drop your ego first of all. Don't think that you've got the secret amazing mix of game or app that no one's ever seen before that'll revolutionize the industry. Those days are over. There's just way too many way people in the market. Identify who your customer is. Know who you want to entertain. Like, really understand them. That's what folks at Mighty Kingdom, I think, do better than anybody else. Know what the market loves Mm. to play and surprise them within that expectation and give them something unexpected in the middle of playing a match three, you know, or a bubble shooter. Um, and, uh, And most importantly, collaborate. Like, don't try to do it yourself. And I think that's the biggest mistake we often see from students coming out of university. A lot of the programmers will say, I wrote an engine. It's like, why would you write an engine? Easy. Unity. It's free. Um, increasingly, they're being guided quite effectively to work in groups of three to six, which is about what your average production level team will be in a free to play app anyway. Mm-hmm. Um, and as soon as you learn how to collaborate, you understand where your strengths and weaknesses are, you identify what kind of customer and what you want to do with them, you'll have successes. The In Show, presented by David Grice and Troy Sincock. News by Shannon Corvo and Claire Murphy. Music by Zach Grice. Produced by Jason Walker. Subscribe to the In Show podcast on iTunes. A Dave and the Beanstalk production. Love this podcast? Support it and sponsor today. Simply head to oscastnetwork.com for details.